Welcome everybody, this is Seattle Hemp Fest Sunday 2012 and we're on the Hemposium stage. Today our discussion is about activism around the country, what's really happening outside of Washington. For everybody to decide what they have to do in this coming election, pay attention to its impacts outside this state. And we've got an incredible panel for you, uh, some of my favorite people. And we got Madeline Martinez from Oregon. She's on the now a, a former executive director, now on the advisory board of Oregon Normal, and she is the proprietor of the world famous Cannabis Cafe. <laughs> then we got Rob Campia, the Marijuana Policy Project in Washington, D.C. Rob has been responsible for many, many of these initiatives. His organization has given help to a lot of the political changes that are taking place around the country. And Tanya Davis, one of my homegirls from Ohio. Uh, uh, Tanya is uh, about five different chapters of normal all put together and uh, is a patient. She can tell you about her own condition, but um, she's been a, a constant activist. And, Debbie Goldsberry, I didn't get a chance to ask Debbie what her current affiliation is, but she has been here, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, starting with the uh, hemp tour back in the early 90s and um, continuing through Berkeley Patients Group, which she's no longer affiliated, and um, now you're a consultant and... Things, so we'll talk about it. Lab things, yeah. That'll be explain her thing. My time's Freedom Fighter of the Year. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Lindsay Reinhardt from Idaho has got a new initiative. Uh, she's getting ready to launch, and she can tell you about that. And I'm Donnie Ward Chapter, and uh, I'm moderator. I'll be back with everybody. Get go about five minutes, ten minutes with what they want to tell everybody, and then we'll come back with audience questions. Go ahead, Madeline, you want to start? Or just sure, why not? Hey, everybody, I'm so glad to be at this Hemp Fest. It's my family reunion, so I'm always excited to get on stage and, you know, just give people the information that's going on in Oregon. And right now, I am so excited about Measure 80. Paul Stanford worked tirelessly and put a huge amount of his revenue, his, his money into this project, and now we have it on the ballot for November the 6th, and it's very exciting because it will grow our economy. We're gonna be saving money in um, our law enforcement resources, uh, something like, what is it, $61.5 million in law enforcement resources that we can use to capture, really get out there and fight real criminals. We're going to be making uh, $140 million will be generated for our general fund, which will go to education, public safety, and health care. And we're also going to have uh, 11.2 million, and I'm looking at my notes here because I'm telling you, in the state of Oregon, when you jump from one ballot initiative to another ballot initiative, here we go again, get schooled. So uh, although I have been the co-chief petitioner of OCTA, the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, twice, there was a little bit of a difference in it, but the, the exciting part is that it will create it will create green jobs. And that's what's so thrilling because uh, unemployment in this country, as you know, is soaring. People are going without so much. And here with our hemp, we have a hemp industry that will really grow our uh, agricultural programs in Oregon. And, you know, of course, we want to feed the hungry. We're known for our food bank in uh, Oregon. And, you know, we can increase that. The, the flour from... Uh, oil that we, we get the seed and we take the oil out and what's left is this wonderful flour that's rich in the omegas um, and uh, I'm just so excited to get out there we've gotten a couple of unions involved we have the support of just about everybody it's kind of rough when the dealers and the police kind of gang up against you you know it happens a lot everywhere and we're hoping that everybody will be supportive and so far we haven't really heard from anybody um, no no real non supporters have come out except as always law enforcement but uh, a little bit about the world-famous cannabis cafe 
we just celebrated our second year anniversary and we're going strong at 322 you know 82nd and we're just rocking pot land we get uh, referrals from the from law enforcement is always sending people to us and the project is just really developed nicely and um, I'm just excited I hope all of you will stop in in Portland and stop at the world famous cannabis cafe which is really really grown I think you'll be happy we have live music on Friday nights and that's exciting but um, I'm trying to think of what else is going on in Oregon. There's so much, but primarily I'm thrilled about Measure 80 and getting the, the most support that we can. Is your uh, hemp stock coming up next week? Yes, year? indeed. September 8th and 9th, hemp stock at Cali Point Park. If you can, what we've done is we've tried to make um, another hemp fest without taking the name. And it is amazing. Again, Paul Stanford. You know, he's, I don't know how many of you know Paul Stanford, but he's pretty amazing. He gets it done and he puts his money where his mouth is. He makes it happen. And for that, I could never, I mean, this is an amazing ballot measure. Hemp Stock is a wonderful event. We've got great bands coming out there. And uh, I think all of you will enjoy it. I hope that we're going to have as many great speakers there as we do here. And you know what our program, the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program itself, let me talk a little bit about that, has really grown exponentially. We have, uh, at last count, I believe 60,000 patients, and we're growing every day. It doesn't seem that they're gonna be able to stop it, although we've had fee increases, which is really concerning in the economic struggle. Uh, a lot of patients are not able to afford the $200 increase. We can't figure out why they can't decrease our fees and then we looked at what they're doing with our money and they're using it really in, in places that I would want it used, in midwifery, in um, health care. Uh, it's, you know, a huge amount of our revenue is being used there. I mean, I applaud it because I, I am, you know, a humanitarian and I think the program would be pleased to see the programs that we are assisting. And I think the important part for the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program is that it's working so well that what can they really say about it? They just try to make it a little tougher each time, but um, it's actually working. 13 years almost of a program that everybody said the feds would enjoy. We have not had one problem other than a couple of years ago they came in to subpoena patient records from the THCF clinic, uh, or the THC clinic, and Paul Stanford again stood his ground and we quashed that subpoena by getting together even our department of justice our uh, attorney general went and fought that so i'm telling you we have accomplished so much in the state of oregon we finally seem to have gained the respect and dignity of the bureaucracy even though you know they say well, we don't really support it they have no choice because we have spoken up twice Thank you. Rob? Um, I don't know why I'm putting on my glasses. But, uh, it's good to see you. Um, so in terms of uh, giving a national uh, landscape, uh, I think one of the, I guess probably I have two key points to make. Um, the one is that there are six ballot measures to pay attention to. There are three legalization initiatives. One was what Madeline was talking about in, in Oregon. The second, of course, is here in Washington, and the third is Colorado. Um, the, <clears throat> there's a chance that all three could pass. There's a chance that none of the three could pass. But what I would say is that if any of the three passes on November 6th, it would actually be whatever state that is would have the best marijuana law in the world, uh, even better than Holland where marijuana is not completely legal. So this is a momentous occasion in terms of three legalization initiatives on three state ballots in one day. This has actually never happened before. Um, an another thing is that there are three medical marijuana initiatives that are 99% likely to be on three state ballots. Massachusetts, which is already qualified for the ballot. North Dakota, where we finished the drive with way more signatures than we needed, and then Arkansas, which we also finished with way more signatures than we needed. So if I had to, to bet, I'd say that all three will be on the ballot on November 6th. And these are three medical marijuana initiatives that would do 
all the things that most medical marijuana laws do, including allowing for the large-scale cultivation and sale through dispensaries to patients with a, a, a broad variety of uh, medical conditions. So if I had to guess, I would say that um, of those initiatives, two or maybe three will actually pass on, on November 6th, depending on how much money there is for advertising. And um, if those three pass on November 6th, then the number of medical marijuana states would go from 17 to 20 in just one day. And um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, because I live in Washington, D.C., a lot of times people ask me, how is it going in Washington, D.C., which is a really tough question to answer because there's a lot, a lot of stuff happening there. But um, on the local level, things are going wonderfully. Um, the D.C. Uh, government, the local government, has authorized uh, dispensaries and grow operations. So uh, what will happen by October is that you're going to have six businesses growing marijuana wholesale, and then you're going to have four businesses selling it retail to medical marijuana patients. So there's going to be 10 businesses operating, four dispensaries within the city, and patients even though we passed the initiative in 1998, and I mean 1998, I don't mean 2008. 14 years ago, the initiative passed, but because of federal obstructionism, there was delay after delay after delay. And now finally this fall, we're gonna see patients with four medical conditions, cancer, um, AIDS slash HIV, MS, and glaucoma, four conditions being able to buy uh, medical marijuana from dispensaries in our nation's capital, which is gonna be humongously important for members of Congress and their staff who haven't ever seen dispensaries before. And so we're gonna be able to educate people on the federal level. And that kind of segues into the last thing I wanted to say, which is that we had a vote on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives in May, 163 votes in favor of prohibiting the Justice Department and the DEA from going after medical marijuana patients and businesses in the 17 states where it's legal. 163 votes, it was actually a pretty good showing considering that the House is pretty heavily Republican. Uh, so we actually think that if there is a, a good turnout for Democratic uh, congressional candidates on November 6th, that our number could go from 163 to you know 180 or 190 or something like that. And when I was talking to Nancy Pelosi the other day, um, the, the commitment essentially from the Democratic leadership is that if we could get our number up to about 200 in the, in the House, then the Democratic leadership would be willing to whip that number from 200 up to 218 to, in order to pass a medical marijuana bill or a medical marijuana amendment. So we actually have a shot at getting real traction in the U.S. House of Representatives within just one year. On the U.S. Senate, I don't know. that We have not had a vote count there. But I, my message is simply that we should have optimism that things are not hopeless in Congress. This is going to take a lot of work, and that's what we're that's what we're all about. It's better if I just kind of lean back. So bear with me, guys. Uh, my name is Tanya Davis, and I'm from Ohio. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things I see going on all over the place. Ohio, actually, we may not have had a medical marijuana law or a medical cannabis law enacted this year, but we had our paraphernalia laws dropped, which says a whole lot. And see, Ohio is um, a different bird anyway. You know, we're allowed to have up to three and a half ounces, and it's a $100 ticket. But where they used to stick people was with the paraphernalia. Now you could have this pot, right? But you better not have a paper or it better not be in a baggie because the paraphernalia would get you taken to jail and get you that felony and that uh, criminal record. So Ohio has the best marijuana laws, I believe, in the country or at least in the top two or three. Um, there was a lot of excitement um, this year in Ohio. Uh, we had a couple ballot initiative attempts. 
uh, two different groups, the Ohio Alternative Treatment Amendment and the Ohio Medical Cannabis Act of 2012. Uh, both of us, uh, Dottie and I, were involved with one or the other. Um, we made a lot of ground. You know, when you get a lot of seniors signing it, and, and you get law enforcement signing it. I had a, a, a law enforcement officer in his uniform sign my petition. How great is that? You know, so don't feel sorry for Ohio, because we're okay. We're learning as we go, you know, and, and we'll convince the big boys to get on board in Ohio. I'm confident of that. Um, you don't realize the freedoms when, unless you come here. You know, you look around here. I talked to a law enforcement officer on the way to this park today, and he was in uniform, and he said, Young lady, are you having a good time? I said, Why, of course. I said, I don't know if this would go on in Ohio, and he started laughing. He said, Hemp Fest is so great, and he told me that. Hemp Fest is so great. He says, ma'am, he goes, we know that the laws are being broken. He looked at me, he smiled, you know. He goes, but those three days, we're not going to enforce it. Go have fun. And I thought, wow, how great is that? <laughs> you know, Vivian has been known forever, so they love him. And I, and I got that gist from that policeman. Now, my point is, what's going on in, in Washington is going in all the states. People all want the same thing. They just have different ways of getting there. And people are so passionate in this movement. You know, I'd like to see everyone, regardless of the organization, to come together on anything that will improve the cannabis laws in your state. You know, you take out the bad stuff. It's just something else to fight for. <clears throat> you know, I'm not taking sides on either way. But I know in Ohio, we would love to have something like this go on. You know? We would love to have uh, people be allowed to have this freedom that you guys have every day. Um, really, really quick, and then I'm going to close. Last August, I found out I've got massive calcium deposits on my brain. Now, the massive calcium deposits are generated from a, a crippling terminal disease that I have, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, which causes severe critical hypocalcemia, which causes all the above problems. Uh, God love my doctors. Uh, they've made me very proactive in this movement because last August the neurolo head neurologist and um, my family doctor who was also my specialist came to the hospital room and told me that uh, Tanya there's nothing we can do for you except treat your symptoms and keep you comfortable go home and eat your cookies literally do what you have to do there's nothing that the medical community can do. I am so pissed off. I, I'm at a different point in my life because there's a right and a wrong. I'm not bothering anybody. I'm not causing any crimes. Criminal, you know, violent activity by trying to save my own life. So I am really calling a lot of people on the carpet because you know what? I'm not gonna go out like a chump. 
I may be in a wheelchair. I may have been given a death sentence and I may not, it may not be enough time for me to get better with my head, right? But our government knows that this is a Dura protective and it knows that it's an antioxidant and both of these I need. You know, I'm going out like a fucking champ. Okay, I'm not going out like a chump. I'm not. And, and my goal this weekend, because this is getting more and more challenging, and the ones of y'all that know me know that. You guys can see that. It's getting more challenging. So I really, you know, if, if our government can own patents on this, on cannabinoids, which is what I need. They can do what they want to me because they're not gonna do anything worse to me than what this disease is doing to me already and the prison I'm already in. So, you know, even the judges in my town said, you know, told someone that I had to inquire. I said, is there something I can do? so that I don't have to be afraid so I can fight for my life, right? And they said, no, there's really nothing, you know, the judges are like, you know, there's really nothing she can do, whatever. But they said, do what you have to do. And I will fight tooth and nail. They wanna come and take me away, fine, do it. But I'm gonna be screaming, medical cannabis, medical cannabis, medical cannabis, medical cannabis, medical cannabis. They're not gonna shut me up. So I'm done, but you know, if y'all wanna talk later, I am here and I'm always available. Always available. I will never get too sick or too big to be available. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. God bless you, I love you. Freedom Fighter of the Year, Debbie Goldsberry. Thank you, Donnie, and everyone here at Seattle Hemp Fest. It's so fun to be here from Oakland, California, and um, representing the state of California to let you know what the latest there is. Um, in California, so many of my friends have stories like Tanya's, and that's what's keeping us inspired despite all the hard stuff that we're facing down there right now. I know for myself, um, I got involved a long time ago in 1989. The very first time I tried cannabis, I guess even earlier, my first hemp rally was the Great Midwest Marijuana Fest, which was sort of the precursor to this back in 1986, the height of the drug war. The first time I tried cannabis, I felt like my life changed on that day. It like changed on a dime. Like I wasn't feeling right in my body or my head and uh, day one, I was convinced Sign me up, I never stopped or looked back, and I used it every day since, uh, unless maybe, oh, I went to Disney World for 10 days. Is anybody from Florida, can you get the dang law changed? Because uh, Disney World, sorry, it's impossible to be at Disney World without medical cannabis, I'll tell you. But anyway, um, 10 days. Um, okay, uh, I, uh, back in the height of the drug war, there was no info about cannabis anywhere. A lot of us were here. Based on the way you looked, you could get stopped by the cops and search for drugs. And we always were. Um, and uh, cannabis users had to learn the laws. We had to learn to stand up for ourselves. We had to learn the magic words. I choose to remain silent and I want to see my lawyer. No, I do not consent to this search. And we had to learn how to stay strong. I worked with a group of people called Cannabis Action Network in the Hemp Tours. We were like evangelists for cannabis going everywhere. Doug McVeigh, one of our founders back there. Doug, wave your hand. He's working here at the Hemp Fest stage at the Hemposium all weekend if you see him. Um, we were on the road for years, just uh, telling everybody about medical cannabis in the height of the drug war. We had, a, had to take a stock and some fiber and some seeds and show everyone, like, look, it really does, it's a shirt, and it came from pot, can you believe it? Um, and it was a super fun time. Cannabis Action Network uh, segued into Americans for Safe Access, because at some point we realized we were putting all of our energy at Cannabis Action Network to medical cannabis rights. Um, so we formed the group Americans for Safe Access, which is just taken off like, uh, you know, wildfire. Um, and I helped form the Berkeley Patients Group, a very uh, strong collective down in the Bay Area where I worked for 11 years as a, an executive director. And two years ago, I got so concerned that 
big business was coming in to take over medical cannabis because that's what was happening in California. If you were there, well, it might have turned your stomach like it did mine with all these people who were coming in and taking our visionary ideas and our hard work and we're gonna make sure that we couldn't get the permits when they came down for the businesses that we envisioned. Uh, people with money and degrees and business school, uh, fancy MBAs were gonna come into medical cannabis and take it over. And so I decided to spend my time helping small business people, mom and pop, and helping shape the next voice for keeping this a nonprofit, not-for-profit, mission-based um, movement for medical cannabis and helping small businesses succeed and small organizations so that we can succeed. Because we were doing the work while those people were going to Harvard and getting the MBAs. It, it doesn't mean that, that they're gonna get the permits, it, but they will if we're not smart. So for the last few years, I've been working with a lot of small collectives and organizations to keep our footing and to make sure that the message goes forward. And uh, I write a column for High Times Medical Marijuana Magazine, which our new issue just hit the, the newsstand. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm High Times Freedom Fighter of the Year, like I told you, it's so fun, okay. Um, the California report is, uh, is like this. It's like a, a prohibition earthquake hit California. And uh, it's like tectonic plates, you know, the pressure builds on both sides and every once in a while it just and, the, and there's chaos and catastrophe. And that's what's happening. We're still feeling the aftershocks uh, down there. And um, those aftershocks are closing dispensaries across the state, open to fissure. The IRS stepped through with all these audits for our top collectives. Um, landlords were targeted forfeiture actions aimed to chill the marketplace, to, to drive people out. And uh, of course, most notably at Harborside Health Center. I believe that on our side, we built the pressure that can of business as a rhetoric was a fail um, and it created the pressure that we should try and avoid and stay away from next time. Um, our side is in control of our message and how much pressure we exert. So what I believe is that right now we need to repair and rebuild and to keep the pressure down. Um, at the, in California before this hit, it really started to look like we were all competitors rather than a community. And so I think as we rebuild, it needs to be as a community. And for example, in Berkeley, we've been very successful over there, but we did have a program forever called Be Cool, the, the Berkeley Cannabis Ordinance Oversight League. We still have to be cool, everyone. Um, with both earthquakes and prohibition, preparation is the key to survival. Uh, our advocates need to build strong foundations um, and prepare in advance for disasters. We can't predict when or where or how the feds are gonna come in again, but we do need to be um, ready to rebuild and to rebuild fast. Our strong foundations should be based on visionary nonprofits and not-for-profit ideas and values. Um, and it, the U.S. Attorney in my area, Melinda Hogg, would like the voters to believe that medical cannabis industry has been hijacked by profiteers. Well, it's our job to make sure that, that it's not, but more so it's our job to amplify our message and our vision so that the truth is told about the medical cannabis industry, that we're mission-based and that we're organized to solve problems in our communities. Uh, cannabis advocates need to build resilient organizations so that we can um, withstand future attacks. You know, we have to properly register our organizations, we have to pay taxes, we have to follow labor laws, and those seem simple enough, but there was a recent survey of the medical cannabis industry in California, and the number one problem we have is compliance with these issues. It's not even the feds are number one, it's compliance with the laws. So uh, we need to get professional help to manage these hard issues. They're not simple issues. Because there are experienced attorneys, accountants, and other professionals who can assist you with these things. We can even get help with this, uh, the hardest stuff like the IRS 280E, you know, the tax minefield that everyone's going through right now. These issues are manageable as long as you have good systems in place. Um, being prepared in advance means running a tight organization at all times. Keep your bills paid. So in the worst case scenario, you don't have a big debt when it comes time to rebuild. Have a good safety plan, an insurance plan, uh, good business connections. You know, right now be using good lawyers, realtors, bankers, lenders, and wholesalers, you know, before you have a problem because they'll all be essential if you have to rebuild after a disaster. And Americans for Safe Access does have a really nice document on their website called Raid Preparation for Medical Cannabis Providers. So go on the ASA website and look at that checklist. It's a 100-point plan to help you be as prepared and thoughtful in advance of anything happening. Um, and I helped co-author that list when the feds raided Ed Rosenthal 
you know, the last time the pressure really built with the feds and we had a crackdown, they raided Ed Rosenthal. I'll tell you, in the end, we came out stronger just like we will this time. Um, to accomplish more than just surviving, I believe we're gonna need to invest heavily in outside assistance. Many people think that lobbyist is a bad word, but having experienced people, people who are experienced in negotiating with government at the local, state, and national level working on our team is absolutely essential. Uh, medical cannabis advocates have yet to make a big impression on Capitol Hill or in our general assemblies in our states, for sure, in California. Uh, cannabis advocates, we should join together and we should invest in respected lobbyists to amplify our messages um, so that they're heard and acted upon. We won't be able to accomplish this goal unless we expand and develop our political connections. Uh, advocates have to work together hmm, to bring good people to the table so that we prevent mission drift in the future. We have to make sure that our movement stays focused on the original goals. Hemp can save the planet for food, fuel, fiber, you know, Jack Herrera taught us for medicine, for adult use, and for personal spiritual use. We need to avoid seeing this as a business opportunity. We need to make sure that our small organizations succeed in the future. We need to treat this as the movement that it is. Um, together, we can end prohibition, but the battles that we're gonna have to face in the future are even harder than the ones that we've faced so far. So be prepared. And right now we have to focus on rebuilding stronger and better. So thank you for letting me be here and say my piece on this. And there's a really, uh, there's a good book available for sale right down the road called Smoke Signals. It just came out, I think, at the Hemp Fest. Uh, Martin Lee, is he still around? I saw him standing out here. But it's a good history of the medical cannabis movement. It tells a lot of the story of Cannabis Action Network in the early days of ASA and a, a lot of people here. So go check out Smoke Signals, too. Good point. All right, from Idaho, we have Lindsay Reinhardt. Hi. So I'm here to talk to you guys about Idaho's medical marijuana laws. Right now they are, you will go to jail. <laughs> Um, so we are introducing a medical marijuana petition in Idaho again, it's our second time around. We turned it in Thursday morning. Um, this petition was written for the patient and not the state so much. Um, we decided that the right thing to do would be to include as many conditions that a physician could in good faith recommend cannabis to so that we're not leaving people behind. Um, we changed a lot of the rules. We had a previous petition called the Idaho Medical Choice Act, and we learned a lot from that petition, and it served its purpose. Um, we learned that we had math that wasn't correct. We learned that our network wasn't correct. We learned that it's really hard to circulate with five people in a petition in your living room, <laughs> you know? We didn't have support. People didn't know who we were. Um, the signature drive actually stood to help educate Idaho in a huge way and educate us. And when we didn't get the signatures, people were like, holy crap, we have to help you get the signatures in Idaho. And so we wrote a petition and it's been through a few lawyers and we're really confident that it's a good one. We allow four seedlings, four immature plants, and four mature plants, patients can grow their own. People can get three ounces every two weeks from a dispensary. It sets up a patient system, a caregiver system, a grow system, a research and test lab system, and an alternative treatment center system. Um, it also has an oversight committee to help keep everything in check with the government. And any money made off of the petition goes back into the program to help fund the petition so that it's not um, going off of states funding, it'll be coming off of this funding. Um, we have grown in leaps and bounds. We have nine teams around Idaho now. We have reliable team leaders. Thank you. We've worked really hard to come together and our communication has improved drastically. You wouldn't imagine the power of Facebook. I couldn't pay enough for the services that they give me for free to help do this. And with how fast it's growing now, we've got a website donated to us. We just got an office. Um, we just got the petition turned in. We're really excited in Idaho. We're gonna have our office launch next weekend. And um, September 30th, we're throwing Idaho Hope Festival. It's a conglomerate of, um, of Moms for Marijuana, Idaho Normal, Compassionate Idaho, and the 45th Parallel. 
so far. And we have an awesome speaker lineup, and our band lineup is amazing. And we're an educational festival, so we set out to educate because that's how we're going to overcome our obstacles in Idaho. The education level is needed so much. There's people that are closet smokers. There's people that live in reefer madness. They don't understand. And the biggest thing we can do to fight that is educate them. And we have a big enough network around the state now, and the creative ideas that have come to us and that have been suggested to us to help educate our state so that they can grow and learn and join us instead of giving us the opposition that we don't want. We want to work together, but we need to educate first because there's just not a lot of it going on. Another obstacle we had was registering people to vote. Um, we registered 4,000 people to vote between June and December of last year, and that was just in Ada and Canyon County alone. Around the state, I would guess at about 6,000 people. And when we get our signatures and people aren't registered to vote, it makes a huge difference because their voice didn't count. And we instruct people not to sign the petition more than once because it's illegal. So then their voice is lost. So now we do voter registration drives. When we are getting signatures, we are registering people to vote. And now we have an office to send them to to have them come back and sign the petition. So we're really excited about that. And our team leaders have chapters set up and meetings set up all around the state so we can keep doing the same things. Um, so people that aren't registered to vote, um, please tell them to. Even people that don't want to vote in an election, it gives them petition signing rights. And so it's really important. And sign all the petitions because you want to show the will of the people. No matter what petition it is, sign it if it's pro-cannabis because you want to show the will of the people. You vote on what you decide, but when you support every initiative, you're saying, I support cannabis, and then you move forward. So you make that decision, and then you, know, you can move forward with whichever one you're gonna vote for, but signing the petition is just showing the will of the people that they want the right to vote yes or no on your initiative. Um, we have a real issue in Idaho. We've got Oregon next to us who can legally prescribe or recommend cannabis to any state in the country. And we have one co-op that's in Ontario that is serving Idaho. And then the Idaho State Patrol is getting really, um, they're cracking down on us. They're looking at license plates, they're looking at handicap tags, they're looking if you've got long hair and a goatee. I mean, they are watching. And we've had people with 69 and a half pounds come through um, under the guise of a medical marijuana card when anybody knows that you are not gonna have 69 and a half pounds with a medical marijuana card. Um, we just had a bust in Southeast Idaho, which is our most conservative part of our state for 40,290 plants. They each had their own sprinkler system. They were all hybrids. And the, the, the police tried to tell everybody it's a cartel grow and that you know, it's responsible in Nevada. And we're like, no, that was a compassion grow. You know, and there's, there's grows like that everywhere. And those are just the ones we, that we find out about on the news. I really believe that Idaho, I know that from people that do grow in Idaho, we have the right soil and we have the right climate. But we also have a lot more going on in Idaho behind the scenes that anybody will talk about. I think that Idaho could sustain its own medical cannabis right now. And um, I think that we need to move forward with that. So we're gonna do PSAs, we're, and people have been offering to help us with that. We got donated a website, so that's been good. We got donated our printing, so that's good. Um, we have this thing, though, where people, I, I, I really wanna make sure I touch down on this well. Please do not come to Idaho and show your medical card. Please come to Idaho and visit us. We're nice people, we have great rivers, we have awesome mountains, we have a lot of outdoor recreation, if that's your sort of thing. But please do not show a cop your card. You effectively give that cop probable cause to search your vehicle if you show them that card until this initiative takes place. So on November 14, when we get vote yes on this, when this goes through, we'll have reciprocity written in which means when you come into our state and you have your card, 
you can follow our law and they can't do anything to you for being a patient in another state. Because not only do we need Oregon and Washington working together and Colorado and California and all these states, but we need to stand together as sections of the country and be like, I should be safe no matter what state I go into. There's so many people that have family or there's so many people that have left my state with, they're called Idaho refugees here and Oregon and Washington. Because we have people, you know, we have the founding director of Moms for Marijuana that moved away because it wasn't safe for her to have medicine. We have Russ Belleville, he had to move away, it wasn't safe for him to have medicine. We have all of these great people that we put out of Idaho and then it's my job to bring them all home <laughs> because we need to change the law. I know that when we change that law, a lot of people will come home and I know that people won't be scared to travel here and I know that people won't, well, in Idaho, and I know that people won't be scared to live there anymore. You know, we've got, I myself have multiple sclerosis. Um, several of my, my team actually has multiple sclerosis. Um, we have a lot of cancer patients and a lot of fibromyalgia patients. And um, when I first got involved with this, I, I jumped in head first because I have MS and I wanted to fight for my condition. I'm on a time clock. Basically, right now I have relapsing remitting, but it's aggressive. So if I don't get it stopped, it will turn into progressive MS. If that happens, then I'm going to have more increased symptoms. I'm going to have uncontrollable muscle spasms. Um, I know what's going to, what I would face and I would rather not do it. But I would also not like to leave my state, nor do I think I should have to. I love my state. I don't think that I should have to move away just because I want to treat my body with medicine that is safe and non-toxic to me. When I got involved, I have to admit, it was because I wanted to change things for me. And then my eyes got wide opened. I mean, people came out of the woodwork and I hear these stories so many times a week of people that have cancer or have MS and they're in jail for treating their, their disease. They get thrown in jail. I have one volunteer, she refuses, I love her, she refuses to quit treating her MS with cannabis no matter how many times they throw her in jail. And it's sad to see because she will totally just put herself out there for that, but at the same time, our state's calling us criminals when we're not, and it's not fair at all. I have people that write me all the time and ask me what they should do. If, you know, if they just got busted for possession, it happens all the time. And it's, I don't know what to tell them other than, you know, don't admit anything. And if you're a patient, you know, you need to tell them that you're a patient if you, if you have to go that far. And that's in court, don't ever admit that to a cop. Um, but I really want to, I really want to um, just make it clear that Idaho has something going on. We need your help. You guys have friends and family there. You all know people there. You come and visit. We are going to kick off the signature drive in September. Come to Idaho Hope Fest. It's September 30th. You're gonna learn a lot. Everybody will learn a lot. I might be preaching to the choir on that, but at least you'll get to see other people getting educated, and that's an amazing thing. Register to vote and come hang out with us. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we got time for a couple of audience questions, but let me ask one first. I mean, none of us are Washington voters and none of us really have a dog in the fight, but does anybody got any comments? Is it yes on 502 or no on 502? Oh, <laughs> Go ahead. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah! That was my answer as well. Um, Sign the petitions and get it. Either one that you guys get is a step forward. You know, it's it's a step forward. And we follow Washington and Oregon. It's our constant leaders. We kind of got like a little big brother arm around us showing us how to do it. And so the further that you move forward and show us how to move forward, the better. Yeah. Well, I would like to say to everybody, I think that you should vote yes on it. And I understand that there's problems with it. And sometimes we have to hold our nose and do things that aren't always as beautiful as we'd like them to be. But I believe that every step forward is a good step. And, you know, I've listened to both sides of the story. But let's stick together, team, because that's how they divide us. 
and I know it's odious sometimes, believe me, I've stood up myself for um, initiatives and ballot stuff that's made the ballot that I really didn't believe in. Once it makes the ballot though, I jump on board. I said this at SSDP because we had three competing uh, petitions out there. And in my personal opinion, I don't care which one of them makes it, I just wanna be on the fucking bus, okay? And now Measure 80 has made it and I'm there and I'm supporting it. When 74 made it, I was there and I supported it. I am a patient advocate. So anything that makes money on the backs of patients, I'm, I'm serious, I run a cannabis cafe, it's $5 at the door, and you can smoke all day free. And, because I support patients, I run out, and I put my own stuff, you know, and this is the way it is, but you gotta support every measure, sometimes you gotta hold your nose and do it. I'm on the board of normal, so yeah. It's a rough, I know, it's rough, I got you. A lot of people are going, normal? What the hell are you doing? But, you know, I'm there, sorry. I'd like to add something to what I said. When I say vote yes, I mean vote yes for legalization. If there's decrim petitions, if there's legalization petitions, um, those are the ones that you wanna vote for. I think that every initiative that you do decide to vote for, you need to thoroughly research before you cast that vote. I think it's a personal decision. And um, putting patients first is always going to be my number one priority. But um, voting anything forward is a step forward and we need to support moving things forward. Okay, we got time for one audience question and we gotta go, Russ. Uh, question for Lindsay, uh, Idaho's kind of unique. It's the only, medical, only non-medical state surrounded by four medical states, Nevada, Montana, Washington, Oregon. Do the effects and the stories and the headlines uh, coming out of medical from those states have a good or bad effect on what you're trying to do in Idaho? Russ is asking if um, other states, what's going on, good or bad effect our, our medical. And yes, it does very much. Where we've got Nevada and we've got Oregon and Washington, Montana and Canada, um, the, the laws that go on and the, the things that happen definitely flow over to us. It shows arguments that will come up in the future. It shows arguments that are happening now. It causes arguments, but it stirs discussion. So when people bring in that amount of cannabis or they have this gigantic growth, some people can say, oh, that's really bad for medical because you they're, they're not using it for medical, they're using it for recreation. Or you could say, no, that's really good for medical because it shows the need to make it okay for the patients to have it. So it's it's a double-edged sword with that one. I mean, some things people, it just, it's a glass half full, you know, half empty kind of thing, really. All right, uh, we got one minute each to wrap up, give your websites, say what you want to say. Okay, um, Madeline Martinez, I am on the board of Normal. I am on the advisory board of Oregon Normal. I had been the executive director for um, nine years and now my good friend Iko is now the leader, the executive director, director Michael Bacara, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. I'm on, um, I'm on just the proprietress of the world famous cannabis cafe. is amazing. Come visit us, USA World Famous Cannabis Cafe dot com. <laughs> Rob. Uh, yeah. So my message, I guess, would be that if you live in. Uh, the three states where we're running ballot initiatives, Colorado, which is legalization, and then North Dakota or uh, Arkansas. You either live there, have a presence there, have family or friends there. Uh, get them in touch with our campaigns in those three states. Um, we're looking for volunteers, we're looking for uh, dollars, whatever anyone can contribute to those three initiatives would be greatly appreciated. And our website is www.mpp.org. Tanya? My message is you don't have to change everybody's minds at once. Just sign, just change one person's mind at a time. And you do that by your own behavior. You know, everyone is watching you. Uh, they watch what you say, they watch what you do, and how you act. And we have to change the minds of the conservative folks, the everyday folks. We're at folks of like minds right now. 
but when we're out of here, we need to conduct ourselves like everyday people. You know, um, you can go to um, a normal life. I was featured in that. Uh, Rob Campia was too, wasn't you? I thought maybe. I thought I saw you somewhere. Oh. <laughs> I hope so anyway. Or I'm embarrassed, but that's okay. My thought process has changed, Rob. Sorry, it was probably Owen Wilson or something. I <laughs> I'll plead the me mental problems here right now, okay? But I'm not having them right now. Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on the uh, steering committee of, uh, or the leaders committee with uh, Normal uh, Women's Alliance. Ohio normal, Miami Valley normal, you're right, I am a lot of normal. <laughs> but you know what? I, I do think that no one deserves caged up for making a choice. I don't care if anyone thinks it's a dumb choice or not. So what? It's their choice. And unless it's harming someone, don't bother me with it. Okay. My final message is get ready for the fight of our lives. We're going to end this 100-year cannabis prohibition, but it's not going to be easy. You have to know the magic words. I choose to remain silent, and I want to see my lawyer and use those words. And you have to know how to say, I do not consent to this search. Uh, medical cannabis is at risk right now. We could actually legalize cannabis and be out of a job at the same time because the one percenters swoop into our movement and take over our visionary hard work and we have to be prepared for that as well. Um, get prepared people, we're gonna end prohibition. You can find me um, on Facebook, Debbie, D-E-B-B-Y, Goldsberry, and I'm on there all the time and I love to talk to people and make new friends and uh, I hope to see you there. Oh, and, and get High Times Medical Marijuana Magazine. I'm in there every quarter. Lindsay. Uh, we've got CompassionateIdaho.net.org and Calm reserved right now. I think we'll probably have Net up first. Uh, right now it's CompassionateIdaho.webs.com. Also, there's IdahoHopeFest.com and IdahoHempFest.com. Both go to the same place. And Idaho Normal. So if you guys want to check those out, that would be great. Um, any of those things, they all have a donate button. We appreciate everything. We run off of donation, and that is it. So um, if you want to go hit that button, we would love to have your help. And uh, join us at our festival and support medical marijuana for Idaho. All right, let's give a hand for our panel here. Madeline Martinez, Rob Campia, Tanya Davis, um, Debbie Goldsberry, Lizzie Reinhardt. Coming up next, we got the business of cannabis expert advice before you.